All right. Well, thank you all so very much. Appreciate it. My name is Paul Keenert, and I'm Associate Vice President for Program at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to um, uh, introduce today's keynote conversation. You know, at RWJF, uh, we have data. We have tons of data from a lot of many, many studies and, and evaluations of our programs. And our challenge is to be able to transform those data into information, and information that leads to action. And that's particularly tough, especially when that research, no matter how compelling it is, competes against the chaos and the noise of modern life. And then again, there are some people like our next two speakers with a gift for cutting through the noise in compelling ways that do naturally what we are always striving to do at the foundation, and that is to change minds. Our speakers are changing minds by changing the conversation about rural America, elevating the personal stories that are so heartfelt and impactful that we are forced to pay attention. And in doing so, we recognize a true need and a commitment that we didn't keep. They are drawing the links between a well-paying job and well-being, between social isolation and despair, between stories that are being told about rural communities and the reality, the diversity, the resilience that lives within them. A fifth-generation Kansan and proud to still call Kansas her home, again, debunking the myth that you have to leave to uh, meet success. Sarah Smarsh has long focused on inequity, how the deck is stacked against rural people. Bodies born into hard labor, seen as dispensable, she writes. Bodies subjected to cheaper and less effective health treatments, bodies maimed and poisoned. In her bestseller, Heartland, we intimately encounter rural life. Sarah introduces us to grandmothers who act as second mothers, to farmers who work themselves to the bone, to builders who can't afford their own homes, and children who are forced to grow up fast. She examines pervasive classism in America and the media's misrepresentation of the people that she knows and loves. Sarah's story necessarily elicits our senses, the sights and sounds, the pleasures and pains to make real the rural experience after so much ignorance and mythology was built up around it. Something we need to do a better job of if we want to change hearts and minds. We're very grateful to have you here today, Sarah. Ken Ward Jr. is a lifelong West Virginian and an investigative journalist with the Charleston Gazette Mail. His 27 years of in-depth coverage of the natural resource industries in West Virginia, I would say that it's as risky as writing about lobbying uh, in Washington, D.C. or casinos in uh, Nevada. Um, uh, Ken has been exposing the true economic social, and health impacts of industrial abuse on Appalachian communities. The world-class media organizations that work with him include National Public Radio, the Center for Public Integrity, and he is now working with the ProPublica local reporting network investigating the growth of the natural gas industry in West Virginia and its impact on the communities and the environment. He made a particularly salient point in a recent interview that I think is perfect for our symposium today. After the 2018 announcement of his win as a MacArthur Fellow, Energy News Network asked him what he thinks he's learned over the course of his career. He said, if I've learned anything in 27 years here, 
I hope that it's been how to be a better listener. One of the things that I want to get better at is talking to people and listening to people who may challenge my hypothesis and may make me think a little harder and hear what someone else has to say. In our country today, and certainly in our state, right now being a better listener is something we all could do. So let's do that. Please welcome Sarah Smarsh and Kedden Ward, Jr. Thank you, Paul. Um, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for making me a part of this. Thanks for Sarah for being here. Um, and what a great quote, because the, the best part of this for me is I just get to ask questions. Um, uh, I don't really have to know anything, <laughs> uh, which is fantastic. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to start just by kind of noting that um, you know, there's all of these kind of discussions going on in what I like to think of the, as the chattering class. You know, the, 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 the people that are on Twitter and the, the talking heads that are on, you know, separate screens on, on multiple TV networks about rural America. And um, so much of it seems to be kind of this, uh, uh, among a lot of folks, seems to be this kind of twisting around and this, this trying to explain this thing that they couldn't believe happened a couple of years ago, uh, it was this election that we had, um, and looking for some, well, gosh, what, how did this happen? And, um, you know, trying to explain away the polls and the little New York Times vote meter thing. And, um, and so much of that discussion, um, what I sense is, <coughs> you're, is that we're lucky in rural America if um, uh, the people that are doing that even kind of do a flyby. Um, uh, and uh, they, people seem to come here with, they already kind of know what they're looking for. You know, this is Trump country. Um, and, and they know the answers um, uh, when maybe they don't, even, they don't even necessarily know the right questions yet. Um, so what I wanted to start by asking Sarah about is you've been doing a lot of traveling around and talking to people um, in rural America. Um, and, and I sense that there's a different conversation going on there. Um, and uh, what are those people, what are, what are people in rural America talking to each other about and talking to you about that maybe the chattering class needs to listen a little bit more to? Mm, yeah. So uh, my book came out last September, and I have been touring the country talking about it for eight months now, just about nonstop, a little bit internationally too, where I, I learned that this so-called rural urban divide or crisis that we're all reckoning with is actually a global concern. Um, but as far as my vantage on it here in the States, um, you know, I'm seeing on the ground what I always knew and suspected. Um, the, the story that's told about that space there, there is, a, is largely a false narrative um, and, and there's a great dissonance between the prevailing stereotypes and tropes about rural America and what's ap actually happening on the ground. So if you're a cable news network and you like conflict and you want to whip up the idea of cities versus country, um, but which drives up ratings and enforces some sort of unfortunate tribal identities, um, then you put up a, a map of the United States where each state is colored either red or blue, as though that um, monochromatic color would represent everyone in that state. Um, and, and actually in, in 2016, just a, in just about every state, almost 40%, so like almost two out of pe five people voted for the candidate who lost in that state. So we're, we're sort of um, uh, rendering invisible millions of people when we use terms like Trump country and reduce regions to political monoliths. So, so and I would add, this is for a whole nother talk probably, but, um, but really what ultimately what those election results represent is who voted. <laughs> and I come from Kansas where our recent Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, um, led uh, uh, unfortunately successful until he was, um, uh, he, 
we, he did not um, win the gubernatorial election last fall, and so now he's, he's not in office anymore in Kansas. But while he was, um, there were very successful efforts at basically voter suppression um, across rural America, which is not just white folks. It's racially diverse. It's politically diverse. Um, it's economically diverse. There are a whole lot of people of all different colors who don't get to vote um, because it's been um, strategically uh, gerrymandered and, and made inaccessible. And my family while they benefit from white privilege, um, are, would be in that camp in that um, if, if you're working around the clock on the farm um, and the nearest p voting site is uh, many miles away and the hours are inaccessible. Um, so, so ultimately, those maps, I think, are very misleading. When I'm talking to people on the ground, it is a much more promising picture than you would think from CNN or MSNBC. People are coming together as communities across even political boundaries and working in a, a space of, that I would call localism of like how do we solve these problems locally when we're feeling sort of not only misunderstood but perhaps even scorned and scapegoated on a national level. Um, let's, let's maybe unpack a little bit of that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, um, uh, that I sense that, that, that you're doing and, and that I certainly try to do is, is kind of narrative correction or counter narrative. And, um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm wondering is it really even appropriate to talk about one rural America and to assume that, um, you know, uh, f farmland in Kansas, that, that the people who live there uh, have all the same ways of doing things and thinking and talking that people in the coal, coal fields of southern West Virginia or steel country in western Pennsylvania and Ohio? Um, is, there, is there room? In, in kind of this space for there to be lots of different rural Americas? Well, there better be room, uh, you know, if, if we want to understand ourselves accurately as a country. Unfortunately, the, um, you know, the way that power structures work is whoever gets to set the narrative often has a blind spot to um, the, the spaces with less power. And, and sometimes it's with direct malice, but sometimes it's just for a sort of ironic ignorance at the top um, that, that the story is told in a way that is reductive to a, a dangerous extent. So, um, you know, of course there's not just one rural America. I happen, being a, a white fifth generation wheat farmer, um, I am sort of, who grew up on like a flat expanse in the middle of the country, I happen to have been born into a sort of stereotype in terms of imagery. My dad has been a construction worker for decades. He wears a hard hat and is, he's got a farmer's tan and is, he's, um, uh, you know, struggles to get den dental care. Um, so these are all sort of, we, we sort of carry with us the, the symbols of rural America and yet what those symbols would represent to someone about who we are, let's say politically, would be like actually opposite of the truth of the way that my particular family votes and, and believes and thinks. Uh, my dad's favorite politician, by the way, is Maxine Waters. <laughs> um, so, um, so I think that uh, this, it, the reason that this is important about, about wellness and health, I'm, I might just loop in here, is that words matter, narratives matter, and, and if we are not articulating the problem correctly, how are we ever going to solve any level of the problems, including the health concerns that we're all in, in here um, today to address? So, um, uh, Just to, to, to kind of spin off of that one, what do you hear about, what are the health concerns that you think that rural Americans in, in the places you've been and where you're from have? Well, just uh, Kaiser just did a great report a few days ago about an unfortunate um, uh, another ho rural hospital closure in Fort Scott, Kansas. Um, and, you know, as you all know, that uh, trend Im impacts more than just health, and sometimes in it sort of becomes this Ouroboros of then you have a loss of economy and infrastructure, and then it's even harder to rebuild the health care concerns. And so, so people are certainly um, uh, concerned about just geographic proximity to care. So one of the um, particular aspects of rural life um, that, that we reckon with and problem solving, of course, is, is that the, the um, barrier to access is not just economic or, um, or uh, racial or ethnic or, or aspects of identity, but rather on top of that also wrote 
you know, geographic distance. And, um, and, and there are some beautiful things that come with that. And, and that's the very reason that some people live in rural communities is that sense of space and, and, um, and vastness and, and, and earth. But, um, but as far as health goes, uh, I was just talking in um, Hutchinson, Kansas, which is a, a town that's maybe about the size of Charleston. It's only um, 30 miles from the farm that I grew up in, and I was addressing their, uh, they have a local health initiative called, the, uh, called Heal Reno County. So they're looking at it at the county level. It's, of course, farmland, largely agricultural country. And, and um, you know, that it was a vastly white room there I, I try to make a note of these things and there was there was a little bit of racial diversity but it sort of reflected the population of the county itself in those uh, terms it was a beautiful evening standing room only hundreds of people showed up to talk about this not very sexy topic of health and um, and every single person in there during the hour-long Q&A engagement was saying why isn't our state expanding Medicaid you know, and this is like so counter, a, a, a TV studio in New York would be like stunned that that's the line on the ground. And, and, and then I can just hear right now comments on some national news at the bottom of the story. Well, then why did they vote against it? Or why did they vote against their best interest? That presumes <laughs> that, that that's, again, that, 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 that this place is a political monolith. And what I try to tell people when they want to cast an entire state or region um, in one particular way, politically or culturally, if you right now do not feel represented by our federal administration, then perhaps logically you can ima imagine that within the smaller political unit of a state or even a county or city, you could live there uh, and not be represented by the people who are in office. So, Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really great point, that, that, that connection between people who don't feel that what's happening on the national level represents their values um, and maybe people in, I don't know, West Virginia don't always feel the same way either. What, um, what, do, what do we do if we're, if we're journalists or if we're in the policy space or what do we do with kind of the um, I told you so isms about um, uh, in, uh, that connect with this idea of voting against one's interest. How, how, what's, what's the effective way to talk to folks who, um, when they see, oh, well, this policy is going to cut black lung benefits for coal miners in West Virginia, uh, say, well, that's what you get. H how, do you, how do you have a dialogue with, with someone who starts off with, well, that's what you get for voting that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that certainly shuts down conversation and progress. And um, I always, I'm, that um, framework might have been sort of articulated prior to this book, but I'm pretty sure it originates with actually a book called What's the Matter with Kansas by Thomas Frank that came out uh, some 15 years ago at this point, I think. And, um, and I've always, um, and, and by the way, and Thomas Frank is, is a lovely man. He did grow up in a very Tony Kansas City suburb, and it's a very, speaking of different, different Kansas or different rural Americas and so on, he grew up in a very different Kansas than I did. And, um, and, uh, and I admire a lot of his um, commentary, but, but I always felt like that framework of voting against one's best interest or being duped into voting against your best interest has, while there are some, from my political bias and vantage, perhaps some truth to it, there, it is also kind of um, inherent uh, with condescension. And if you're having that assertion levied against you, how does that feel? You know what I mean? So, um, so how do we have a better conversation with, with the folks who, for, for whom maybe that, um, that line does represent something accurate or a seed of it? Um, you know, I, my first, <laughs> the, the first way that I come at any conversation about community progress is humility about um, you know not presuming that I know better than the person walking in his or her own shoes. And, and I come by that humility easily in the political specter because I was raised with somewhat different political views than I and, the, and my, actually my whole family now hold. So we were in what I might call like a moderately conservative community and kind of my, I had like a Reagan era childhood. Um, and um, and, and mo most of my close family have sort of swung left, but, but there was a point in the 90s where um, conservatism was really sort of having a backlash moment against some gains in the other direction where, 
you know, I was kind of, as a teenager, I was hearing some of these ideas like, well, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I was working my butt off just to become a first-generation college student. And some of that sort of messaging resonated with me at a deeply emotional and psychological level that isn't always rational, you know what I mean? So when I was a first-generation college student, I took a sociology class called the Sociology of Families. I saw the data about if you come into a particular kind of life, then your outcomes are more likely to be X, Y, Z. And that blew all my political ideas all to hell. And, and now, um, you know, I'm, I, I hold a different viewpoint. But, the, but my point is, and what I'm saying to you, Ken, is I'm not, I wasn't a worse person then. And I'm not a better person now. I'm the same person with extremely different sets of information. Um, you know, I, I come through all, to all of this uh, kind of through a, uh, a reporter's lens and, and thinking about um, uh, the, the, the kind of information people are getting. And, and you mentioned, you know, you, you're not a better person, a worse person, or a different person, you're the same person, you just have better information. What, what do you, what, what, what do you think are, are the places we should be finding that better information to better understand? You know, uh, if, if folks want to read uh, who's, who's covering issues out in rural America and doing it well, um, who's not parachuting in from Manhattan to do a, a flyby sort of story, what, sh what should we be paying attention to in the media? Mm, well, I certainly, well, your own work is a great example of, of, of good stuff that's going on at the local level and with reverberating national effect. Um, uh, I admire public radio has a network called Harvest Media, this sort of a um, uh, cooperative between several public radio stations that are mostly centered in the Midwest. They do a lot of great work specific to my region. Um, and it's, but and, and I think that part of how we rectify this concern of, of different sets of information is the is you know local news, but it's also it's this the national news paradigm that increasingly it's like of course this perfect storm where so much um, local reporting has fallen um, and and not yet been rebuilt, even though there are great efforts going on to that end in the digital era and and the, the the big dogs that were left are where people increasingly turn for all of their stories and narratives and that is the na the national networks who so if you're sitting in your recliner in small town Idaho and somebody in New York is telling you a story about your place as though it's the truth that's this sort of disconnect it's like the it's like the media parallel to how the food system is screwed up, which is evidenced in my having grown up on a wheat farm. I helped raise wheat. My hands bled pulling rye, invasive rye out of wheat fields every summer. I weighed wheat trucks at the co-op. And do you want to know what the bread on our table was when I was a teenager in the 90s? Highly refined white wonder bread from a day-old bakery at the closest small town that we paid 50 cents for, and it was wrapped in plastic. So. Like that sort, of, uh, there's sort of this, how we really solve this problem about two different sets of information, unfortunately, right now is you've got half the country watching Fox News and half the country watching MSNBC. And so while I'm all for like increasing um, efforts at the local level, there is something that is like so toxic in that like top level system being broken from the rest of the information sphere that that's, I think, a bigger problem to contend with. Um, uh, one of my coworkers, Katie Coyne, is a Report for America. Oh. We're gonna swap them out real quick. So sorry. Is that one better? Okay. See, you give a newspaper guy the technology. This is why newspapers are failing. We don't understand technology. Um, uh, one of my coworkers, Katie Coyne, is a Report for America uh, fellow who uh, covers uh, Southern West Virginia, and um, I was going to speak at a conference talking about. Uh, journalism in Trump's America, you know, very serious, heady stuff. And, and I asked Katie, you know, when you, she drives around southern West Virginia, that's, that's you know, what, what do you hear from people? Do people ask, is that, are people talking about Trump and Washington and Russia and on and on? And, and she said, nobody brings it up unless I ask them first. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, it, you know, what's your experience? Or, she, Katie says, what people want to talk about is, you know, their local school or that highway that needs fixed or their water system that needs fixed or this local plant might close. What's your experience about what 
people out in rural America are talking about if we ask them an open-ended question? Well, I think it's, um, now I, is that all right? Okay. Um, you know, I think that it's, um, it, it tends to be the most primal concerns, and I think that that's true rural and urban, uh, but, it, but it's a sort of different iteration of it in rural America. So the, the health concern is how, how, how can I access health care, whether that's from economic hurdles or, or a local hospital closing. Um, and then, you know, concerns about the local schools and is the bond issue going to get passed so that they can buy new books. And, um, and, uh, but I totally echo your, your friend's um, point that um, so in, uh, let's see, it's been three years now since we were mired in the 2016 election and one of the sort of iconic images of that is the Make America Great Again hat. In those three years in Kansas, I've only seen one MAGA hat in the wild. <laughs> Okay, so, so the thing is, and this is in rocket science, if you hold a rally and then all that, those people come to the Mecca for the rally and then you've got the cameras rolling and then you put it on MSNBC and it's good TV, it's extremely misleading about the, the bigger character and picture of the place. So um, I joke about how this sort of parachute idea you were referencing earlier about sometimes well-intentioned national media, but they'll, you know, I, 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 this was a joke that I tweeted, but it was so plausible, apparently, that people thought I was serious. I was like, um, uh, national reporter approaches Iowa resident who's wearing an ACLU t-shirt and says, do you know anyone who wears a MAGA hat? And then, you know, and then that person might be like, well, there's one, there's the one jerk at, at the diner. And then the and then the reporter races off with the camera, you know what I mean? And I just like posted, this was just like a little satire that I did on Twitter and people were like, oh my God, that is so typical. <laughs> like it's, you know, it's like Veep where we're like post satire with some of these issues. Um, so, but, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it, uh, there was a, it, I'm not making this up, there was a, a national political correspondent for a major news organization who uh, just yesterday uh, was tweeting to sum up a trip that they had taken to Iowa and the summation was it sure is flat. Now you mentioned earlier that that you think people p rural Americans are more optimistic than than they're than than they're given credit for. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they optimistic about and why? Well, when you're living in that community, and most, I don't know the numbers on this, but I'm pretty sure that, that rural populations, while, while they can be transient and while it is transforming demographically um, along with some immigration trends and, and other sort of shifts along racial and ethnic lines, um, by and large, a, a, a rural place right now is, has, is comprised of families who have been there for many generations. Um, and, uh, and and that looks different, you know, in, in the South versus in the Midwest versus in the Pacific Northwest or whatever. Um, but but if you've been so rooted in a place for generations, and that, that is a particular identity and relationship to um, just the earth that sometimes is lost on very transient urban populations. Um, if if you if you have the stories of that place like that deep in your bones and your psyche, it's you can be living in the midst of what would seem to someone on the outside like crisis and yet every day be feeling pretty darn good and enjoying your life. So like I tell people, I never in a million years thought that my family was poor and there are some, there's some good things and bad things about that. The, the, the bad thing is, you know, we have been telling ourselves a false story about a lack of class structure in this country for so long that I didn't, I didn't understand how disadvantaged we were but the but the beautiful part of it is like um, you know I had enough to eat and a roof over my head and we had like this wild freedom out in the country that I've never enjoyed anywhere else and we our lives were full of joy and humor so so often these despairing headlines are so um, there's a there's a, a judgment and a condescension wrapped up in that sense of pity and the folks where I'm come come from don't don't want to be pitied. You used a mentioned a word there that's not. I don't think it's really allowed to be talked about in kind of American 
polite society class. Um, how does how does class figure into your work, <clears throat> and, and and how does class figure into what rural America what what what's good about it and what's challenging about it? Well, so I set out to actually um, the first thing that I wrote that kind of quote unquote went viral, and then from that point on, really all I ended up ever addressing was socioeconomic class one way or another was was an essay called Poor Teeth about lack of access to dental care. And it kind of centered on my, my dad's struggle to, he couldn't afford to get, because due to political compromise, the ACA was passed without um, dental as a component. And so even if you gained coverage in, in 2014 or thereafter, you're still struggling to get a, a cavity filled. Well, my dad had a cavity turn into, you know, it's infected at the root, and then ultimately it turned into sepsis. And, um, and it almost killed him. So like 2013, a uh, lifelong construction worker um, has a nearly fatal bout with um, a rotten tooth, basically. That's in the richest country on earth. So, um, so, the, so many people um, contacted me about, like thousands of people sent me messages about that story that, that somehow had never quite been articulated. And I was thinking like, what in the world? How are we at this moment in our supposedly advanced society when, when people just, haven't even felt, there is such a, a, a veil over the truth about economic inequality in this country and the ways in which it intersects with race, gender, and a whole bunch of other aspects of identity that in 2014, all I did was articulate it and then people are like, I've never heard someone say this. And, and, and the, tr the trick that we do socially and culturally to ensure that uh, veil stays up has to do with shame. So, so you know, my, my dad felt ashamed to talk about his teeth, and he very bravely let me do so with his blessing. Um, but, but, but when you've got to kind of keep up these appearances like this is bootstrap America and I'm getting by on my own, that doesn't leave much space for the vulnerability of like, and meanwhile, um, there's poison in my blood because uh, my, I, I can't afford a dentist. One, <clears throat> one thing that I kind of struggle with is, is to what extent some of these, well, must pull myself up by my bootstraps sort of um, narratives are internalized and are coming from us, and to what extent they're uh, being overly reinforced then by some national media portrayal of it. And and with health issues, I think you see that you know, uh, dental care obviously. You know, if, if folks think that there's still not some amount of shame in communities where the opioid crisis is hitting uh, and, and that people don't want to talk about their their relative who had this problem and had an addiction problem or mental illness of any kind and, and the sort of <clears throat> the, the societal uh, uh, messages you get not to talk about that, to, to what extent do you think that that sort of... Uh, Pull yourself up from your bootstraps is 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 overly reinforced by some outside messaging. You know, it's hard to. It's kind of a chicken and an egg sort of conundrum in that um, wherever those stories began, and I have a feeling that it was they were artfully constructed <laughs> um, and and have been successful with their mission, which was to basically keep people like my dad from feeling outraged and flat out revolting in a system that ultimately couldn't function without their labor. Um, today, you know, I think that it is both coming from popular culture, news media, um, but it also, yeah, arises from within the, their, the very community. And that's why I go back to why um, narratives matter and words matter, because the hell of it is you you can start believing the lie about yourself. You know what I mean? And, um, and so the way that this um, keeps us from progressing as a country is, again, if we, we are dealing with things with, with, without looking right at some of the most glaring problems, um, and we're not articulating, you know, there's a, I don't know who said this, but it's like, a problem well articulated is a problem half solved. And if in 2014 I was like literally the first person to talk about the the the, the problem of of dentistry at just the the level of the human body as relates to poverty, um, 
we're, we are just now on the frontier of beginning to write centuries of telling ourselves as a country that we're something other than the kind of monarchy and class structure that from in terms of the, the um, white European foundings of this political unit, the United States of America, we fancied ourselves, we broke away from that place. And actually I find that um, uh, British editors are more likely to publish my stuff sometimes because they feel more comfortable in this conversation about class where I have to sell it to American editors to remind them why it might matter. Well, of course, I mean, because of course in America class doesn't matter because everyone can just pull themselves up. Yeah. And it, um, the the other sort of myth of this 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 the the rural urban divide and and um, what do you think about how class is in being able to talk about class in a more open way is is perhaps one way to 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 erase that kind of mythical divide. Well, my, I'm a little biased on this because I'm a storyteller by profession and training and nature. And so I really do feel like, like I mentioned that kind of small community town hall that I spoke at last week about health concerns in rural Kansas. And, and, um, and, and it was so healing for that group. Of, there, like I ran my mouth for an hour and then they, they talked for an hour, which is what I was really excited about. And, and you could just feel, you know, the barriers of the community coming down when each person stood up and said, you know, this is the thing about my sister who couldn't afford care and her cancer was caught too late. Or here's the thing about um, my, my son's teeth. Or, um, you know, I'm only covered in this non-expansion state when I'm pregnant. Um, and how does that make me feel psychologically in terms of my value as a young woman and so on. You know, you just like, I don't know what the political spectrum in the room was, but, but when people, and some people even bore witness to their privilege, God bless, like we need more of that, you know, and that comes with some, some conundrums. So um, just allowing people to directly speak to one another and share their stories without, nothing against our industry, but we've been talking about some of the ways that it's limited, um, democratizing the space of storytelling, I think holds real promise for um, allowing some of these class walls to come down. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's, uh, for me, it's perfectly fine to have some things against our industry. We do a lot of things that aren't very good, and, and we've kind of constructed a lot of this. And one of the things in working with um, some really great people at ProPublica that they like to talk about is um, trying to understand um, who your audience is and who your community is and, and, and how those are often, unfortunately, kind of different things. You know, I know, you know, my paper, um, we cover a lot of stories about communities outside of Charleston and the Kanawha Valley in West Virginia. And our audience, uh, I guess, the, the, the people who own the place would want me to say the audience is the people who subscribe. And, and, and that's who we think of as our audience. But our community is a different sort of, uh, of, of set of people than that. Um, we're often doing stories um, uh, the question becomes like it, it's been bandied about a lot with Report for America um, are are we doing stories um, about a community or for a community and so I guess that's one of my questions for you is is what is your community versus what is your audience and and who are you telling stories about or for I love this question and I think it is so important um, for like a holistic approach to just communication. Um, when before my, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> before my book came out, I told my publisher, I don't want to be going back to your earlier point about like there isn't just one rural America. I said, a, I'm never going to get up on some stage or and say I speak for all of rural America or all of the working class or all, you know, and there are a couple of people who are happy to do that. And, and I grit my teeth when I see them on the screen. Um, but, and then, and then the second part of that was I told them, I don't want my book to be an explainer for more privileged folks. Now it is a beautiful thing and an important thing when readers come to me and say, the world you grew up in totally foreign to me. I had it a little better in a lot of ways. You opened my eyes. Thank you. 
that's awesome. But what I'm really in it for is when people come through the book signing line and they say, this is the first book event I've ever attended. My dad has only ever read one book in his entire life and it's yours. And, and the thing is, like, there are all these systems that strategize about all these institutions within communications and media that strategize about the most likely demographic audience because like, well, this is who's gonna consume in uh, public radio and this is gonna, who's gonna buy books and so on. And I'm in that room saying, you got it all backwards, you're framing the question wrong because the, the problem is you're not creating content that they connect to. And once you do, they'll, get, they'll buy that book and they will tune in. I'm in the process of developing and producing a podcast right now, the goal of which is to reach farmers on tractors who have their smartphones and, and, and all sorts, you know, people who should be, who should have content available to them in the podcast space but haven't thus far. Um, um, one of the things I know that you also talk about is the, the demographic changes that are happening in rural America. And I, I, I hope you maybe talk about what you see and, and, and what you think that that means for the country at large. Yeah. Well, the trend in Kansas, and I, and I believe this would be true nationally too, is that um, the popul you know, populations have been um, de on decline, not just in recent decades, but like literally since the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> um, and, but yet there is a, a growth in those communities that tends to be um, in, among non-white populations. So in western Kansas, for example, we have a robust meatpacking industry with, uh, in the realm of industrial ag. And, um, and, and those counties are, tend to be a uh, white minority and they've for decades been um, kind of repopulating and growing um, by way of Hispanic uh, immigrants and beyond. So, um, so, so that's the future of, of this country and, and, and certainly of rural America. Um, and, and in terms of like what that means about rural, um, you know, again, the, I think the national media would paint that as a crisis and they would fixate on you know, the, the real problems and tensions and, and um, rooted in uh, racist and, and white supremacist structures. But, but that's not the whole story. There are also communities working together um, and those stories need to be told too. Um, uh, is anybody, other than you, who else is kind of telling those stories? Oh gosh. Um, that's a, a, a good question. Um, I really like, so uh, High Country News does a lot of um, good reporting from uh, a perspective other than like white rural. Um, but in terms of people talking specifically about that shift in demographic, that's definitely a, a, a space <laughs> that needs more people talking. And that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of self-conscious about you know the, the irony of when I am trying to get, say I'm being interviewed by um, CNN and I'm saying, by the way, not all rural of rural America is white. And here I am as, you know, the, the person whose privilege allowed me to ultimately end up on this stage probably has something to do with my white skin. So uh, my responsibility is at least to spread that message and hope that more people's stories come up uh, behind and around me um, from different perspectives. Um, we're going to start moving into Q&A now. Um, speaking of listening and uh, um, uh, if, if you have a comment, that's great, but try to kind of at least mold it so it appears to be a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> questions? Um, uh, well, let me ask, let me kind of continue then and ask, I mean, we've, we've obviously, you know, um, talked a lot kind of about how the story is told and, and um, why is how that story is told what, important for the sorts of folks that are working in this space that are in this room? Well, I think when we, when we talk about health, um, you know, it's easy to think of this as a wholly physical concern, but health and wellness, of course, as, as you all know, goes beyond that. And um, there is something that I would call just like a, um, I hesitate to use the word spiritual because I don't, I don't necessarily mean that in any context that remotely involves God or religion, but if you just think of, of your, your being, 
your sense of your relationship to the world, the universe. Um, if, if every story being told about you is that you're backwards, ignorant, your community's dying, why don't you just leave? Um, and meanwhile, you're doing the work of picking the lettuce in California or raising the wheat in Kansas that's on the plate of the people who are carelessly levying those condescending comments, that is a bitter pill to swallow spiritually and psychologically. And I, you know, I, I don't know how to back this up other than my own lived experience. That has reverberations in, in the way of wellness and health, whether it's that um, shame or a sense of not being validated somehow um, is related to a, a, a general malaise and a need to self-medicate. Um, you know, there's the, the, the stories that we tell about ourselves and about, um, about specific populations within our country, um, they affect the wellness of those communities. Um, if you have questions, just uh, over here. Okay, there it goes. Um, hi. I um, have a question that actually relates back to the previous panel, and then something you just said brought, made me think about it again, which is access to broadband. So when we talked this morning, when the panelists were talking this morning about the lack of access to broadband, first of all, I'm a city dweller. I'm not rural. And life without broadband, I can't even imagine. It's so fundamental to everything I do and everybody I know does. And so we heard about it in relation to telemedicine, to financial uh, wellness and, and um, um, financial literacy and managing your finances, education. Um, we didn't really talk about it, but for small business and doing business online, um, import, export. You've just mentioned now um, telling stories. And so much of storytelling happens through social media and online. So. Can you talk a little bit about your views on the lack of broadband in rural America? Sure. So um, I was born in 1980, and so I was kind of, you can track the current kind of digital moment along some pretty pivotal moments in my life. And in theory, you know, if we were like a middle or upper middle class household, there would have been like a, a um, Apple computer with a green screen in our house when I was a kid and there would have been like a dial-up AOL computer in our house when I was in high school and I would have gotten a cell phone around the time I graduated for uh, graduated high school and all that none of that okay we didn't have air conditioning in our farmhouse um, I got my first computer in I think the year 2000 I got a cell phone in like 2005 so um, so I was on sort of like the or the the early moment of the digital divide, and um, my uh, professional and economic outcomes have been such that that I quickly sort of made up for that space. But um, but but here we are, some 20 years later, and and it's and it's still a major concern. Um, I will say though that I I have um, I wish. Um, a, a totally democratized broadband access in this country for obvious economic and cultural reasons. I, I hesitate, I, I pause though on sometimes that turns into, I don't know if any of you guys take the Sunday Times, still I do, um, and there's been like a full page ad for the last several weeks um, that I think Verizon's been taking out that says, um, close the digital divide. Let's get into rural America or whatever. So like, you know, corporate, you know, because they, they care um, is why. Um, so, and every time I see it, and you know, it's this idyllic scene of like a barn and a fence and stuff. And it, God, it pisses me off so bad because it's like, you know, th there are, there are factions that to my mind are, are not necessarily well-meaning who, who's, mission will be to exploit and profit and sometimes this idea about closing the digital divide sometimes is then it turns into also like tech will fix rural 
nah, I can tell you that ain't right. Because that is like imposing this um, uh, structure onto a space where it doesn't necessarily fit. Read Wendell Berry for more on that. Um, but, um, but, but of course, as far as just like being able to, I, I do, I, I hope that those um, inroads toward access are done thoughtfully with the local communities in mind. That's the bottom line. Sure, right here. Um, both, of you, both of you guys have told stories and championed people who are facing long odds. I'm, I'm interested in what you've seen out there, what gives you courage, what inspires you uh, from these stories that you've heard. I want to know what Ken thinks. Um, wow. Um, well, just I think that um, people that get up every day and get their kids to school and go to work and work hard um, and uh, go to church if that's something they like to do. Uh, and I, I think that those are all kind of heroic stories. And, and the places where I tend to <clears throat> meet people, unfortunately, are when in the midst of doing that, something really awful happened to someone in their family by no fault of their own. You know, a coal mine blows up. Uh, and and those sorts of things and and the folks that are able to kind of keep keep going in life and find time somehow to struggle with that um, and struggle for justice in that those are the sorts of things I I don't think there's anything particularly heroic about what I do in going and talking to them uh, I think being willing to t tell me their story is is what's more heroic. in Berea, Kentucky. This question's inspired by something that Sarah said, but it's really a question for both of you. You talked about how information changed your perspective. And um, my question is, what makes the difference between information that changes people's perspective and information that people are just hit with that they're able to ignore or resist or counter somehow? What, what makes that difference? What makes it work? You know, I've thought a lot about this because certainly um, this country's run by a whole bunch of very highly educated and well-informed people who, depending on your views, perhaps are, are making terrible decisions without concern for facts. Um, and, and so I always caution against framing anything in terms of like educated and uneducated. And you can hear the the, the judgment they're in usually in the way that we have those conversations. My dad is uneducated in a sense, but um, but I, as I told you earlier, you, you couldn't guess his views based on that. Um, so, but but in but to more to the point of your question, I think that um, there might be have been something to the fact that I was. That moment when I was accessing some new information, I was also sort of newly untethered from the place where my identity and social belonging were contained. So I was, uh, you know, going to school in this small, moderately conservative town. Um, I always had like a pretty like socially liberal family, but we were also starting to get a lot of those sort of like mid '90s conservatism ideas by way of cable news and so on, and. Um, and then when I'm like a college junior or whatever, I took that class that blew my mind, um, I was no longer, you know, I, I believe that political identity is better predicted, is best predicted by one's peer group more, more so than any other asp input, you know what I mean? And so the fact that I was now on, on an institute, you know, I was on a college campus, there were a lot of different ideas going around, I was a little bit more of like a free agent, so to speak. I, I wasn't, you know, a, a teenager in a small town wants to fit in and and I was even kind of like a firebrand independent kid and even for me that was a factor um, but the fact that I I got that information at a moment where I also was being encouraged um, to to expand in whatever direction I saw fit um, because you know if you're if you're a, a, 
a, a teenager in some rural place and every, I'm, I'm zooming forward to 2019, and, and every TV, in every, the local pizza parlor, parlor and the laundromat and so on, and the doctor's waiting room, every TV's on Fox News, and that's the only input that you've got, and the conversations around the dinner table among people whom you depend on for your own survival and who you love dearly and who love you are all saying the same idea you're going to be on that train. I don't care how righteous you feel like you are right now in this moment in the chairs that we're sitting in. Um, so, so I think it's, um, it is about information, but it's also about um, somehow as a community and with a national and local conversations, um, cultivating um, a, pri a sense of pride about what we might even call independent American thinking. I, th I think we have time for maybe one more question. I've got the mic. Um, <clears throat> so this is probably like thinking a few steps ahead and a painting with a really broad brush. I mean, rural life is so complex. Um, is there the equivalent of gentrification, urban gentrification for rural areas? And what would that look like for the populations that are there? And you know, if all of our solutions are about bringing in something from the outside, and again, painting with a really broad brush, what does that do to folks who are there? So I, you know, where I grew up, California Central Valley, it's not little family farms anymore. They're huge corporate farms, and you know that changes the dynamic. And then also doing a lot of work in urban areas where we see where we go and we finally improve a community. All of a sudden, the people that were there are no longer able to be there because it's become so desirable. Mm -hmm. So what is there an equivalent? Um. I think, I don't know if any of, of you saw, there was a story, oh gosh, I think it was, it was in the last week and there was quite a, a little bit of an uproar about it within the rural community that was sort of like, um, I think the headline was like, uh, urban millennials moved to rural but now they're contending with the, you know, like abortion law crisis or whatever. And that was sort of like a springboard to discussing with this very, <laughs> Um, condescending framework, well, you know, these like cool, s educated city people ventured out into these dangerous hinterlands to improve it, but can they really hang there because it's so hard? Um, and um, so, yeah, I think that um, there, there is a sort of parallel, um, certainly in economic terms, how it relates to race probably and ethnicity probably depends on the region and the area of the country and you're talking of course about the central valley um but yeah there's there's i think that um the remote professions that that digital has enabled are now to to the benefit of rural in, in many ways allowing folks who maybe normally wouldn't have set up shop there to live and enjoy those places and hopefully help improve those places and become part of that community. But it's just like any other um, uh, shift or entry point. You know, there's, there's got to be a balance between you, you bring the, the tools and assets from where you come from, but also hopefully are um, um, humble to uh, the place you're moving in. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think there's parallels for sure. Yeah, and I, I think that there's historically at least in 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 West Virginia the that happened first in late 60s early 70s with the kind of back to the lander movement and and you know there it, it brought a lot of kind of diversity to a lot of places um, and uh, when you talk to folks who did that um, uh, almost uniformly they will tell you they learned uh, a heck of a lot more about uh, how to how to get by uh, than from from the folks that that were natives there than than what they shared and what they brought to the community and I think you are seeing more of that now with um, you know uh, I, I I agree with the idea that you know uh, that it's kind of nonsense to think well tech is going to save rural um, you know we saw that with this you know this the New York Times did a great story about coding for miners and but but you you do see and there are great opportunities for uh, working remotely and you know living in like Fayette County, West Virginia, because you like to kayak, 
Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, it'll bring with it challenges, but we've been there before. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Ken. Thanks again, Sarah and Ken, for a really rich conversation. I'm going to just give you all a few instructions as we head to lunch break. Um, first, a quick reminder for those who haven't suggested ideas that they want to have a discussion about at 2.30, please feel free to do that during our uh, the lunch break. We want to make sure that folks hopefully grab lunch quickly at the um, out right outside of this room and that if you are interested to come back in before the end of the lunch break, uh, both for folks who are here in person or live streaming, we're going to show a couple of videos of communities not too far away from here that have won the RWJF Culture of Health Prize. Um, Williamson, West Virginia, and Garrett County, Maryland are two just because they're close by that we thought would be really valuable to, to show. So we'll start those a little after noon, um, and at 12.20 we'll get back into the discussions. Thank you.